Thank you. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four. But thank God we do here today, and if you do at your house, it's another thing to be thankful for, right? Amen. And so um, we gather on the first day of the week to celebrate the Lord, to reestablish our connection with Him and with each other, to find encouragement and hope and teaching and training and community, right? We celebrate community together. So this next song talks about how mighty God is and how everything that He's that has happened in our lives that have been good has been because of his mighty and powerful hand, especially our salvation. Two, three, four. <laughs>
thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for strengthening us. And for even when branches break, we know that you are the, the strength underneath us and you right. hold us up strong and unite us together. We thank you for this community of believers that lift each other up, that unite and help those who are in need. And I just pray that you would speak through Tom today and that our, our praise would be a pleasing aroma to you. In Jesus' name. Same old road for miles. 
thousand miles If you've been here in the same old voice Tell the same old lies If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside There's a better life
morning and thank you for joining us for worship at Hillcrest. Here are some upcoming events that may interest you. As always, more information about these and all Hillcrest activities can be found online at hillcrest.church bulletin or by scanning the QR code on the screen. Everyone is invited to attend our Sunday evening launch event called Love Songs Across the Ages. Come and join food, a live band, and much more on Sunday evening, February 19th at 6 p.m. in the Hillcrest Gym. Stay tuned for details. Then our Sunday night studies will continue on February 26th at 5 p.m. We will have a study for everyone and childcare will be provided. Contact Jonathan Yates for more information. Interested in learning more about Hillcrest and how to join our church? You are invited to attend the Discover Hillcrest class led by our pastor on Sunday, February 26th, right after morning worship in the Hillcrest Gym. To register for this free class, please go to hillcrest.church slash events. Do you have a child between the ages of two and 22? Would you like to see an end to defiance, meltdowns, tantrums, and arguing? Would you like to improve their focus, attention, and organizational skills? We'll plan on attending Celebrate Calm on February 24th and 25th. This conference will provide you with practical tools to help in parenting. Register today. Again, you can find more information about all of these activities and more at hillcrest.church slash bulletin. Finally, don't forget to fill out the connection card by scanning the QR code on the screen or in the pew rack in front of you. The connection card gives us a chance to know you're with us today, and it gives you a chance to respond to what you've heard. All you have to do is fill in your name and email address. If you're visiting with us today, you can pick up a copy of our pastor's book, Winning Ways for Free, at one of the exit doors behind you. And if you want to know more about placing your faith in Jesus or joining our church, there's a spot on the card to ask for that information too. Thank you for listening. Now let's listen to today's message. We're in a Sunday morning series that started last week. It's called Getting Along. And we're looking at eight biblical solutions to conflict. We began the series last week with some instruction from God's word on how to tame your anger. And today we are going to look at another subject also from God's word, and that's the importance of thinking when, when. So many times when we are in conflict with somebody, we have a win-lose mentality. We assume that conflict resolution is a zero-sum game, and out of it comes a winner and a loser. There can't be two winners, and we want to make sure we're not on the losing side. In fact, sometimes Christians uh, have a win-lose mentality, and they think they're still being godly in their relationships with other people because they don't have any animosity toward the other person. They don't have any desire to sort of stick it to the other person or get retaliation. They're just sort of neutral emotionally, but they still feel that uh, when it comes to conflict resolution, there's always going to be a winner and there's always going to be a loser, and they don't want to be the loser. And yet when we get into scripture, we find that we are to approach every difference of opinion with a win-win attitude. Uh, take a look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. We find in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Not only, but also. Not only your interests, but also look to the interests of others. In other words, this verse, to use a modern phrase, says that we are to think when, when. I read about how Mount Everest came into existence. It happened because two continents collided together, Eurasia, the Eurasian continent, and the Indian continent, and they are still compressing together. And as they compress together, all that rock and dirt has to go somewhere, and so it goes up. And it has, over the centuries, formed the Himalayan mountain range, and the largest of the Himalayan mountains is Mount Everest. In fact, the uh, Eurasian continent and the Indian continent are still continuing to press against each other, sending up Mount Everest to continuing heights about four inches a year. Now, I want you to think about this. If there was no conflict, there would be no Mount Everest. 
and the world would be a poorer place for it. Every time you and I get into conflict with another person, it can turn out to have a beautiful resolution to it, as stunning and as beautiful as Mount Everest. But it requires that we think when, when. About 30 years ago, Roger Fisher and William Urey wrote a book called Getting to Yes. It has been translated now into over 25 languages. It has been read by millions of people. And this Harvard Business School book talks about the principles required to get both people to yes, to think when, when. Those four principles in the book I could summarize in four words, relationships, interests, creativity, and standards. The amazing thing is that the principles from this Harvard Business School book were already in another popular book that's been around for at least 2,000 years. I'm talking about the Bible. The Bible really is the world's most practical book. And you look into the Bible and you see that it tells us something about relationships, about interests, about creativity, and about standards. Let's first of all look at relationships. Separate the people from the problem. That's how you get to yes. Separate the people from the problem. When disagreements arise, we tend to take conflict personally. Why? Because the way we see things, uh, we think as the result of uh, our own goodwill and our own wisdom toward the world. And so when somebody disagrees with us, our first reaction is to think that they are striking at our sense of value, our sense of worth, uh, and, and, and what we consider our wisdom. And, and, and if we feel that way, the other person feels that way as well. Now, if we're going to separate the people from the problem and focus on the relationships, it's going to require three things. You can see this in your sermon notes. First of all, we have to understand the perceptions of the pre people on the other side. Now, now, understand what understand means. To understand somebody's perception does not require that you agree with their perception, does not require that you agree with them. But you do have to get to a point where when you are explaining their perception, they look at or they listen to your explanation and they see themselves in it. In other words, you can't make this cheap caricature of their perception and think you're going to get along with anybody. You, you can't uh, mischaracterize the way they understand things. The very first step in any sort of con conflict resolution is to at least uh, mouth back to the person their perception of things in a way that they could see themselves in. And, and so that's very important, perception. And then a second thing we have to do if we're gonna keep relationships important, if we're gonna focus on the people instead of the problem is, uh, we need to take seriously the emotions that are involved. You know, this is something that is sometimes overlooked. Uh, those of us who are leaders in church or those of us who are leaders in business or on sports teams or whatever, you know, if we're Christians, we pray through and we think through what we believe that needs to happen and, and we state it with some sort of excitement because we believe that we've got God's voice on this matter. And then sometimes we are shocked when we are just absolutely slammed, verbally slammed by somebody who opposes that. And our first reaction is to ask, where did that come from? Now listen, we will be much better leaders if we really ask that as a question instead of just state that as an exclamation point. In other words, if we try to understand the emotion and where that emotion is coming from, that allows us to focus not just on the problem, it allows us to focus on the relationship. A third way we focus on people and not the problem is by paying attention to the way we communicate. There is a difference between getting something off your chest and getting something into somebody else's heart. Most of us assume that we have communicated, but we've just vented. We've gotten something off our chest and we feel like, okay, well, at least we've talked. But we're not communicating accurately unless we're focusing on the other person. How are they going to perceive the things we're trying to say? Do, they think, do, do we tend to think emotionally and they think logically? Do we tend to think logically and they think emotionally? We need to communicate in such a way that, that it gets into their heart, not just off our chest. Now this subject is so important that, uh, to the subject of getting along that in this series, Getting Along, we're going to have an entire sermon on what the Bible has to say about good communication skills. That's coming up in a few weeks. But for now, let's just pay attention to the fact that we need to focus on people and not the problem. Relationships 
are important. Now, when you're in conflict, focusing on the person and not the problem is biblical. It's not just something that comes from a Harvard Business School book. It comes from God's book. Look at Romans chapter 15, verses 5 through 7. It says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he goes on to say how we might have that spirit of unity that brings about wonderful praise and effective witness to the outside world. He goes on to say in verse 7, accept one another, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Now the word we translate accept there is a very intense word. It has, it has to do with bringing somebody to your side. It has to do with seeing somebody as on the same team as you. Even the word could be used to bring somebody into your embrace. And so we need to focus on a relationship and not just on the problem. We need to uh, do this. Now, I've just described a lot of really hard work here. And in my 40, 40 plus years of adulting, I can say that I have failed at this almost as often as I've succeeded at this. It's work. And I can tell you out of my own experience that if you decide to focus on the relationship and not the problem, that doesn't mean the other person is going to reciprocate. Sometimes they're not going to be interested in that at all. All they want to do is focus on the problem. But you do what God calls on you to do, and God will be glorified. So here's what we need to do. We need to focus on four things, relationships, interest, creativity, and standards. The first tactic is to focus on the relationships. Focus on people and not the problem. Here's the second point, interests. Focus on the interests and not the positions. Notice that word shows up in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, there's a difference between an interest and a position. And this, ba this passage does not say, let each of you focus not only on your own position, but the position of somebody else. It says focus on not only your interests, but the interests of somebody else. So, for example, if I had a neighbor who had a yapping dog that he kept out all hours of the night outdoors, my uh, position may be that he needs to get rid of that dog. But my interest is, I want a good night's sleep. There's a difference between those things, right? On the other hand, and by the way, I, I don't have a neighbor with a yapping dog. I think I better clarify that. I'm just using this as an illustration. I've had one before, but I at present do not have a neighbor with a yapping dog. But, but if I did, I would have to pay attention to the fact that he also has interests and not just a position. His position may be that he's got the dog outdoors uh, through all hours of the night, but his interest may be that there have been several break-ins in the neighborhood and he wants his dog outside to patrol the, the, the backyard. Or he's got a, a young dog and if he's uh, out from the house at night and the dog's inside, he'll tear up everything so he puts him outside, at least until he gets back, gets back home. So we need to understand that we have interests, but we also have positions. And, 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 and last week I, I, I used the idea that... Um, Life is like driving, and I said that in driving, most of the time, our accidents, our collisions happen at intersections. And just like driving in life, most of our collisions happen at intersections, our collisions between people. So at the intersection of work, at the intersection of church, at the intersection of school, at the intersection of, of, of the neighborhood, it's when your life intersects with somebody else that, um, that we often collide with each other. And when, when I used that illustration last week, it was interesting. I, I ran across this week uh, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase in the message version of the Bible to James chapter 1, verse 19. This is interesting. Post this at all the intersections, dear friends. Lead with your ears, follow up with your tongue. Now, this is paraphrase of a verse that we know better as everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. As we listen, as we try to identify the interest behind the other person's position. And as we try to identify our own interests behind, the other, uh, behind our position, and we try to communicate that, we're going to get a lot further in solving our relationship problems. Now, I want you to notice that Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 does not say, 
Just ignore your interests and only look at the interests of the other person. Squash your interests and only look at theirs. It says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. In other words, it's legitimate for us to recognize that we have interests in the midst of a conflict and we want to put those interests in front of somebody else. Thinking win-win is not that I'm the winner and you're the loser, but neither is it I'm the loser and you're the winner. We need to be recognized that we have interests, the other person has interests, and the Bible tells us to look to our own interests, but not just to our own interests, also to the interests of others. So, relationships, interests, creativity, and standards. The first tactic is to focus on relationships, separate the people from the problem. The second tactic has to do with interests, focus on the interests, not the positions, and here's the third focus, creativity. Brainstorm creative options for solving the problem. Once you're focusing on each other's interests instead of each other's position, it frees you up to think of a variety of solutions to meet the interests that each of you have. In the case of the yapping dog, for example, any number of solutions could meet my neighbor's interest in security. Uh, he couldn't just have his dog in the backyard. There are a number of other things he could do to meet his interest for security. At the same point, when I focus on my interest instead of my position, there are any number of ways I can meet my interest to getting a good night's sleep instead of just telling my neighbor to get rid of his dog. My interests and his interests are important, and now we need to get together and brainstorm how we can meet both of each other's interests. Conflict resolution involves coming up with a whole lot of ideas so that you can come up with one idea that's really good. And, and, and sometimes what that means is you need to brainstorm. Some of you have done brainstorming sessions in business settings before. I've done brainstorming sessions in, in church settings before. And typically the way a brainstorming session works is you, you state to the group a question or you state to the group a problem that needs to be solved. And then for the next 10 minutes, you're just to throw up onto the dry erase board as many ideas as you can possibly think of. You could even set a timer for 10 minutes and just let everybody just free form, think about all the different ideas that you could come up with. The only rule during those 10 minutes of brainstorming is nobody gets a chance to critique another person's idea. No matter how outlandish the idea may seem to you, no matter how ludicrous it may seem to you, during those 10 minutes, nobody judges an idea as to whether it's good or bad. All you're trying to do is throw up as many ideas on the board as possible, and then you start evaluating. After the brainstorming is over, you start ev evaluating which idea is the best, which one should we come up with. Now that can work in resolving issues and relationships too. If my neighbor and I were visiting together over his yapping dog, one of the solutions that might meet his need for security that doesn't involve having his dog out in the backyard is he can invest in a security system. And that way that's all taken care of. Or one solution to meet my need for getting a good night's sleep without just telling my neighbor to get rid of his dog is to get one of those uh, white, noise, white noise makers and put them next to my bed and with that constant hiss of sound it drowns out anything that's not immediately in my bedroom. Now, they, neither one of those ideas ultimately may be good ideas. The point is that there are always solutions you can reach when you're focusing on the interest and not the position. Now, when we do this, we have a chance of seeing a Mount Everest rise up in the midst of that conflict. Remember, I said that Mount Everest uh, was created and is still being created today because of the compression, the, the conflict between two continents, the Indian continent and the Eurasian continent, and all that rock and, and uh, dirt has to go somewhere. And, and something beautiful has resulted from that. And in our conflict, something beautiful can result, something we never anticipated ever seeing could result, but only as we're getting together and focusing on each other's interests and brainstorming on how those interests can both be met. I don't know if you know this, but this is actually why deacon service began in the church all those 2,000 years ago. You know, tonight we are going to ordain two more men to our deacon ministry. And I hope you can come to that service. It's here in the auditorium tonight at 5 p.m. It's only going to be for about 40, 45 minutes or so. You notice, uh, especially uh, you football fans, that we scheduled this after the playoffs and before the Super Bowl. I know my church. And so 
there's really no real reason, at least when it comes to football, for you not to be here tonight. Come tonight, we're going to sing some songs about service, we're going to sing some songs about church, and we're going to celebrate the ordination of these two into deacon service. But, but how did deacon service begin? According to the Bible, in Acts chapter 6, deacon service began because there was a conflict that arose in the church. I mean, the church was only a few weeks old, a few months old at this point, and, and, and conflict arose in the Jerusalem church. The Greek-speaking people in the church uh, accused the Hebrew-speaking people in the church of showing favoritism to their widows in the daily distribution of food. And so the church came up with a solution. They said, all right, choose from among yourselves seven men who will do the serving. They'll serve the entire group of widows, Hebrew-speaking widows, Greek-speaking widows. They'll serve them all, but choose from among yourselves seven men who will do this. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but look in Acts chapter 6 sometime, and you will notice that all seven names of those deacons are Greek names. Not Hebrew names, but Greek names. What, what was the church doing? They were recognizing that there was a body of people in the church, Greek-speaking people, who felt that the Hebrew-speaking people were, you know, taking advantage of, of the Greek-speaking widows. And so they said, all right, let's get a bunch of Greek-speaking people in the church to be responsible for the distribution of food. And everything got taken care of at that point. And at least that conflict was dealt with at that point. And that's how deacon service began. Creativity. The church got together and recognized the interests behind the conflict. And they came up with something that caused both groups of people, the Hebrew-speaking people and the Greek-speaking people, to be happy with the solution. You know what the people were doing there in the first few weeks, first few months of the early churches? They were living out what the Apostle Paul would later write in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's interesting the way Paul puts it. It's out of reverence for Christ. Not just appreciation for Christ, not just gladness that you belong to Christ, but out of reverence. What does the word reverence imply to you? It implies fear, doesn't it? It implies this sort of holy respect. And because Jesus died for us, because Jesus brought us to himself, because Jesus is coming again to bring us to himself, because Jesus is the judge of all the world, it's out of reverence for that that we submit to one another. So, relationships, interests, creativity, standards. These are the ways that we get to the point where we are thinking when, when. The first tactic is to focus on relationships, separate the people from the problem. The second step is to deal with interests, focus on the interests and not the positions. The third step is creativity. Brainstorm, creatively think of a range of solutions and choose one that you both agree can solve it. And then finally, here's a fourth focus, standards. Agree on the standards that you will use to solve the problem. If the two of you walk away from your brainstorming session, you've come up with what you felt was a solution, but neither of you have explicitly stated what you feel is a satisfactory standard that reaches a solution to the problem, what's going to happen? One person's going to walk away thinking this is a satisfactory solution. Another person is going to walk away and say, this issue isn't solved until these steps have been reached, these steps have been taken, and then you're back into conflict again. And that's why it's important to agree ahead of time on how you're going to measure progress in, in, in the efforts towards solutions. You know, my brother and I are um, a year apart, and so when we were little, we would sometimes fight. Now, I know that sounds unusual, to know that two little boys who were so close in age to each other would argue, I know that does not happen at your house, but it did happen at ours from time to time. And I remember one, one particular time, my, uh, we were arguing, my brother and me, over the remaining piece of chocolate cake on the cake dish. And my mom suggested that uh, we just simply share it. And uh, she gave me the knife and said, you cut it. And I thought, all right, I've got the advantage here. And then she said, and then your brother gets to be the first person to choose the piece he wants. <laughs> you can bet that no matter how little I was at the time, I cut that right down the middle exactly because my brother was going to be the one who got a chance to choose which piece he wanted, right? But what was happening there? Standards were being set that would 
solve the problem. So it wasn't just you guys split it among yourselves, but here's how you're going to split it among yourselves. And both of you are going to have your interests taken care of by doing it this way. Now, the, these are the things that we need to focus on. Four things to focus on according to the book, Getting to Yes. And in this order, relationships, interests, creativity, and standards. And the amazing thing is that 2,000 years before that Harvard Business School book was written, God's book was already telling us to do these very things. In fact, all four of these principles show up in one single story in the Bible. The first chapter in the book of Daniel. Some of you know the book of Daniel. You know that Daniel was among other Hebrew young men who were brought out after Babylon invaded Jerusalem. Babylon came in, invaded Jerusalem, demolished the temple, tore down the, the walls of Jerusalem, brought all the best and brightest citizens out to Babylon. And one of the reasons that that was the practice of the Babylonians at that time, whatever smaller nation they invaded, they would always bring their top citizens into Babylon. One of the reasons they did this was so that they could train those people to think in Babylonian ways and enable Babylon to rule and control the land that they had taken over. And so in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel and some of his friends are given this opportunity. They are given this opportunity to enter into this training program to think in Babylonian ways and think in Babylonian terms so ultimately they could help Babylon rule what used to be the, the nation of Israel. Uh, and uh, Daniel and his friends were brought into this training time and they were given an opportunity then to have some of the best food in the land. The, the food that was brought to the king's own table would be also brought to them. The problem was that a lot of that food was forbidden by the Old Testament law. And so Daniel had a potential conflict here. He didn't want to eat food that was forbidden by the Old Testament, but the captain of the guard had an interest as well. He didn't want to lose his head. And, and uh, he was afraid that um, if Daniel and his, and his friends uh, didn't eat the proper way, according to the Babylonians, the proper way, that they would uh, start getting behind the other people and that this captain of the guard would get into trouble. And so what did Daniel do? He proposed that uh, something take place. He proposed that uh, an experiment take place, that he be given just vegetables and just water. And just within two weeks, 10 days, uh, the guard could look and see if there was any difference with Daniel and the rest of the people that were in the training program, and uh, he could make his own decision from there. Now you think that every one of these things we've been talking about today, all four principles are in play. First of all, Daniel had a favorable, a prior favorable, favorable relationship with the captain of the guard, and he focused on that. It was important to him that that relationship be maintained, so he focused on the person and not the problem. Second, this led him to identify the interest behind the position. Daniel's interest was to obey God's law. The captain of the guard's interest was to keep his head. Third, uh, this led Daniel to propose a creative solution, you know, give us the food that we desire. Uh, for 10 days and uh, see what happens. And then fourth standards, after 10 days, Daniel said that the guard himself could judge for himself whether this experiment actually worked out. So he focused on relationships and interests and creativity and standards. God has a way for conflicts to be resolved, not just resolved in a way that hostilities are done, but resolved in a way that is as beautiful and stunning as a Himalayan mountain range. But the only way we're going to do that as Christians is if we pay attention to the gospel first. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, we read, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. But then notice how Paul reinforces this. He goes on to say in verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You see, that's what makes this message today more than just a TED talk. For a lot of people, I think, they go to church or they choose a church based upon whether the pastor can give them a really inspiring message, something really motivating with a one, two, three step that they can go out and put into practice and their lives are improved. But going to church isn't just a self-improvement process. Going to church is learning how to live in light of the gospel. The gospel tells us, according to verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then in verse 6, he goes on to quote this early Christian praise song. One of the earliest Christian praise songs in the church was about Jesus leaving his interest behind in heaven, coming down to live our life and die our death to serve us, 
to meet our need to have our sin taken away. And God, the Father, was so pleased in His Son that He raised Him up from death and He uh, exalted Him to the heavenlies and there He has the name that is above every other name. That, that, that Christian hymn is, a, is a, in a nutshell the gospel. And so the Apostle Paul in this instance is saying, if you believe the gospel, and I hope you do, he said, then you need to live out the gospel in your relationships with other people. This is the way God related to you. In Jesus, he set aside his personal interests. He came down to this earth. He met our great need. Now you go out and do the same. And you see, that's why the instruction in the Bible is laid out the way it is. In every place where the Bible tells us to do something, whether it's to take care of the poor or be more generous or go on mission or share our faith or in this instance, have good consideration for each other, in every instance, the ethic is based upon the gospel. The thing we're supposed to do is based upon the thing we believe. And we believe that Jesus died for us and rose again. And now as we go out and, and be that kind of person for other people, be Jesus for other people, we get a chance to show people what the gospel looks like and the way we get along. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us with this. There are two groups of people here who need to be thinking about how to apply this passage. First of all, there are people in here and online who have yet to say yes to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it may be that you occasionally come to church so you can get kind of an inspirational shot in the arm or uh, understand a little bit better some principles for living. And uh, certainly the Bible is inspirational and the Bible gives us principles for living. But you realize today that the first step, the most important step in, in making any change in your life is to believe the gospel. And you haven't done so before, but you want to do so today by saying in your heart, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for dying on the cross to take away my sin. Give me a clean heart inside and help me to learn how to follow you all the days of my life. But there are a lot of others of us in here today who have believed this gospel but we still have grudges unresolved. We still have broken relationships that aren't fixed. We still walk into every conflict thinking win-lose. We want to make sure we're the winners and not the losers on any conflict. And we need to pray something like this. Dear Jesus, help me to not just believe the gospel, but to live it. Help me not just to trust the gospel, but to reflect it. Help me to see that the way you treated me and our difference of opinion and my sin and rebellion against you and the way you treated me and serving me and laying aside your interest to meet what I needed, help me to see that that's now to be reflected in my relationship with other people so that you will be glorified and so the gospel will be put on display. Even before I say a word of evangelism to somebody, I can, I can imitate the gospel and let them see it on, on display. And help me to do that so that you will be glorified. Lord, I pray these things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like our musicians to come forward uh, for this last song and our ushers to come forward to receive this, this offering today. If you're a guest of ours today, we'd love to know how we can email you or mail you some more information about our church. There's a, a print copy of our connection card in the pew rack in front of you. Or whether you're here or online, you can also go to our online bulletin and our online connection card. And just at least give us your name and email address so we can send you some information about our church. It'd be such a privilege for us to know that you were with us today. But uh, you can also um, uh, indicate on that card, maybe you have a prayer request or maybe you want to join up with this church and want to know more. You want to join up with Jesus and want to know more. You can indicate it on that card as well. Uh, we had a wonderful... Uh, time yesterday so many of our people had a wonderful time at the um, Daughters of the King uh, banquet and uh, thank you for a, a segment of our of our deacons were there to serve as well it was fantastic seeing all those pictures you make sure and come back tonight as we install two more deacons into our deacon service Lance Carm our deacon of the week come lead us in this prayer let's pray God, Lord, you are, you are Father, you are the provider of all things. Sometimes we get stuck in a spot, we don't know what to do, we don't know where to turn, but God, you are there waiting just for us to look to you. You provide solutions and your divine wisdom. And God, this is especially important when we have conflict and tough times with other people. God, 
We just need to remember to turn to you, and, and we just thank you for providing solutions when we couldn't imagine what to do next. God, and your, your, your divine wisdom is just there and, and uh, providing ways that we, we could never imagine. God, we just thank you for your love and your wisdom and, and your help and all things, and always seeking us to bring us to you. God, we also just thank you for providing uh, for us in, in so many ways, and we just bring back to you these, these tithes and offerings, and we just pray that you can bless them and send them to, to the world to help others to, to see your love as uh, we serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.